Thank you for joining us as Levi continues our study on the Book of Beginnings, the first book of Moses called Genesis. First of all, before we get started, I want to say that I want you all to remember God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of courage, love, and a sound mind. So you do not need to be afraid because if you are in fear, you are tormented and perfect love is cast out fear. I understand precautions, safety, all that stuff. And so you do as you need for precautions, okay? But I want you guys to know that the Lord keeps his hand upon those who are his and that you do not need to fear things. Everything that's happening in our world, all the craziness that's happened, don't be afraid. Just trust the Lord and keep your eyes on Christ because if you take your eyes off Jesus, man, you'll get so distracted by the storm and you will have all kinds of issues. Listen, it's simple as this. Peter got out of the boat, watched Jesus, and he walked on water. No matter how the waves were, no matter how the storm was, he was always going to be on the water. The minute he saw the storm and his focus went to the danger of the storm and how overwhelming the storm was, he began to sink. And you have to remember, keep your eyes on Jesus. I want to encourage everybody in that as we continue forward as we go through this. Now, let's pray because Lord knows we need it. All right. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you that we come together for a study and just uh, thank you for a sense of humor. And um, Lord God, we just thank you that uh, we can be together for this. Speak to us through your word. Help us to grow in you every day. And uh, Lord, we just love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's start this off. Now, if you guys remember, we've been going through the table of nations. We covered six and seven, and then we jumped over to 13. We're going to come back to 8 through 12 because we're going to be talking about Nimrod. All right, Nimrod here. So let's kick this off by reading verses 8 and 10. And it says, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it was said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of the kingdom was Babel, Erech, Achad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. So let's look at this right here. Nimrod, all right? This gentleman, Nimrod, he was a very arrogant person. Nimrod actually means rebellion, okay? Rebellion. And Nimrod started Babel, also known as Babylon. He started the nation of Babylon. As we see here, this is Babylon. This is what it looked like. It was by the Tigris and Euphrates. So Babylon's in Iraq. So if anyone's been to Iraq and down to the Baghdad area, that's the Babylonian area. And Babylon was huge. The empire of Babylon went all over. And they knew what they were doing with their aqueducts and all the water. You can see all the different artwork. And we're going to look at some of the other things here. Now, it says that he was a mighty hunter. But Nimrod was actually the first world leader, if you want to look at it like that. He was the first world leader. Because at this time, everyone's speaking one language, correct? So there's not multiple languages. He's the first world leader. And later he builds this tower called the Tower of Babel. And we're going to look at that another day. The term mighty hunter before the Lord. This is not Nimrod serving God. It means Nimrod was rebelling against God. He was a mighty rebel against God. All right. But it says a mighty hunter. Does anybody know what Nimrod was hunting? Humans. Very good. He was hunting humans. That's what he liked to do. That's why they called him a mighty hunter. He was hunting mankind. Okay. Nimrod, he was uh, a pretty disgusting individual. We're going to look at this in a little bit. Now, we're going to look at a couple verses together because there's a few I want to work together so you guys could see this and you'll get a good picture, right, of Nimrod. So I want everyone to turn to Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8, starting in verse 13. And he said to me, this is the Lord speaking to Ezekiel, Turn again and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. In other words, this is Ezekiel seeing the temple. What's happening inside the temple has been corrupted. There's all kinds of wickedness going on. And he says to the Lord's house, And to my dismay, the women were seating, were seating weeping for Tammuz. All right, so we're going to look at this Tammuz character. But you got to understand what was happening. They were in the temple at this time. They were doing all kinds of disgusting things. They were worshiping the sun. They were using incense to make it look like the prayers, but it was for the sun. There were all kinds of sexual perversions going on in the dark. 
There was just disgusting things. And the glory of the Lord was departing from the temple. It's called Ichabod in Hebrew. You ever heard that term Ichabod? You ever heard of Ichabod Crane from the Headless Horseman? Ichabod means the glory has departed. Never name your child Ichabod. It is not good. <laughs> You're naming him the glory has departed. All right. You're cursing him. Ichabod. You'll never look at that the same way again. All right. Ichabod, the glory's departed. And so when this happens, Ezekiel is seeing the cherubim. They're there again, just like in Ezekiel chapter one. And he's recognizing the four faces. But now there's one with a staff and a rod. And it's marking the individuals that are of the Lord with the symbol of Tav, the ancient symbol of Tav. Do you guys remember that from the Hebrew class? What's the ancient symbol of Tav? The cross. The, cross, the ancient symbol of Tav. So he's marking a cross on their foreheads to seal them. In the Lord and all the ones that didn't have the cross seal on them were going to be wiped out by these cherubim. They were going to come through and kill everyone. Right. But notice here they are worshiping Tammuz. They're weeping for Tammuz. So let's take a look at this. This Tammuz character. Right. What we see here. This is a rendition. And this woman right here. Her name is Simiramis. And it's spelled S-E-M-I-R. A M I S Simiramis. Okay. This is another rendition of her. You can find these in the museum. Simiramis. Now Simiramis is known as Nimrod's wife. Simiramis. We also have an issue here because if you look at this picture, does this look familiar to anyone? Do you think it's Mary, but it's not. This is Simiramis and Nimrod. This is the statue of Semiramis and Nimrod. Semiramis was also Nimrod's mother. He married his own mother. Oh, no way. Yes, she was called the Queen of Heaven. This is a rendition of Semiramis and baby Nimrod. All right? But notice how people were quick to think it was Mary. There's a reason for that. They call her in the Babylonian Semiramis the Queen of Heaven. Has anybody heard that term before? Yeah. They call Mary the Queen of Heaven in the Catholic Church. I'm going to show you guys some things. Now, I'm going to give you a forewarning right now. You're going to get offended. The things I have to show you from this point forward can be offensive and bother you. And I also have to forewarn you that even though the things I'm going to show you that have to connect to holidays, I'm not endorsing don't ever celebrate this holiday because you have to use wisdom in this. But I want to show you. All the connecting dots here. All right. Now, none of these pictures are going to be grotesque or vile or nothing like that. So don't worry about that. That's what you're worried about. But you will probably in your spirit be like, what? And if you grew up in the Catholic Church, you're probably going to be like, wait a minute. I have some things to figure out real quick. And again, this is not an attack on the Catholic Church. I want to be clear on that, too. I just want to show you how this all bled together. Levi, yes. Is there a reason why they made her look like Mary? You mean they made Mary look like her? Because <laughs> she's before Mary. So here's the thing. She's called the Queen of Heaven. So this is the Queen of Heaven. That's the actual rendition of Semiramis, the Queen of Heaven. Now, you notice some things. This is a Babylonian rendition. Owls and lions. Now, does that mean the owl is evil? No. Is the lion evil? No. Because the lion of Judah is who? Jesus. But Lucifer is referred to as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. All right. So it's all in the context of how you are looking at these things. The thing is the queen of heaven has multiple names. Okay. And yes, the Catholic church says Mary's one of them. But the thing is that the queen of heaven is also known as Ishtar, which I will get into a minute, but this is another rendition of the queen of heaven right here. This is the other version of the queen of heaven. Almost looks like a female angel and the crown she's wearing looks pretty familiar. Doesn't it? Okay. Take what you will of it. Notice what she's surrounded by. Serpents. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this symbol of the serpents before? Medical. Medical. Pharmakia. All right. What is pharmakia? It's drugs. It's the Greek word for actual witchcraft. All right. Now, I'm not saying if you have to take a Tylenol, you're practicing witchcraft. All right. But I'm saying that witchcraft, they use heavy drugs to induce visions. This is why when I talk to people who have come to know Christ after they were like heroin users, they talk all the time about spirits running in and out of their bodies while they were on these drugs. And sometimes it's not even heroin. It can be crack cocaine. It can be 
all kinds of drugs. Even weed, pot is a form of it because you're worshiping a plant rather than God. I've talked to Christians and people in a church about weed. Like, no, man, it's a, you know, God created it. And they're so argumentative about the plant. It's like they're putting the plant higher than God. Now, I had somebody say, well, God created it, you know, so isn't it for us? True, but there's also a thing called strychnine, and it's not good for you either. Here's the other thing. This is another rendition of her, the Queen of Heaven. Notice this one. So here she is. She actually has a skull-flamed head on a pike, and she's wrapped around by the serpent. Who's the serpent? Lucifer, Satan, all right? So this Queen of Heaven has this. And yet somehow this got turned into Mary and Jesus. So you have to ask why? Well, what happened? Well, a lot of what was in the Babylonian culture bled into the Romans. And it's all the same thing. Every culture refers to the queen of heaven. It's a spirit. And then it just got adopted into the Catholic church. And it's not good. Is Mary the queen of heaven? No, no, she is not. She's not the queen of heaven. So let's talk about Mary for a minute. So Mary, when we read about Mary in the Gospel of Luke, it says she's highly favored. Why? Because she was the mother of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But even Mary in the Gospel of Luke recognized that she needed a Savior. Within the Catholic Church, they will teach that Mary ascended into heaven and she never died. They will also teach that Mary was born of a virgin birth as well. And that's not true either. And then the other thing is taught is that Mary only had Jesus. That's not true either. When we read scripture, Jesus is there teaching and they say, your mother, your sister, and your brothers are here. And I've talked to Catholics about this. They go, oh, no, see, see, what happened is Joseph was older and he had a wife with kids and his wife died. And that's really his stepbrothers. That's not the truth. That's not true. Mary did not remain a virgin for the rest of her life. After she gave birth to Jesus, she had other children. In fact, did I just say children's? Had other children. <laughs> wow, my Hispanic came out. My bad. All right. So... Jude and James. So, yes, Jude and James are the brothers of Jesus and they're writers of the gospel, right? So, uh, I can't imagine being the brother of Jesus, you know? Why can't you be more like your brother? He's perfect. Because he's God, Mom. What do you want me to do? <laughs> All right? He never gets grounded. So, Semiramis becomes, they call her the Queen of Heaven. This all gets bled in. And, and going back to Mary, highly favored. And, and she's the mother of the Messiah. In fact, in the Jewish culture, every young lady back in the days of Jesus sang if they would be the mother of the Messiah. That has been lost along the way. In fact, when you read Daniel chapter 12, it says that the Antichrist will not give recognition to a woman. But it's not like, oh, he hates women. It will be that he won't recognize the importance of them and he will treat them like second class. And that he hates the concept of the virgin birth. And he says he will not adhere to the God of his fathers. All right. But he will introduce a new God, a God of fortress that will destroy the strongholds of the earth. All right. So this Antichrist will bring in a new kind of religion that will be global. All right. This is connected to what we're about to look at right now. Let me go a little step further. The worship of Tammuz went all the way back to the flood. And atheists love to use the story of Tammuz to fight against the story of Jesus. If they can figure this one out, they will counter the story of Jesus with this one. And this is why you need to know this. Because when they come to you and they say this story I'm about to tell you, it's going to sound just like Jesus. And they're like, see? And they'll also use this with another god from Egypt called Isis. So this is the story. The Babylonian religion of Tammuz says he died... By being killed by a boar. Then he was in hell. And Semiramis or Ishtar. All right. His mother was so sad she went down to hell with him. And the story goes on to say that she cried and was so sad when she went down to hell with him. That she pleaded for him and he was released and he was resurrected three days later. So the story of Tammuz is he dies and three days later comes back to life. Then you say, Jesus died on a cross for our sins and was buried in the grave and overcame death and resurrected later. And the atheist goes, time out. So was Tammuz. Tammuz died and was resurrected. You got to understand this is Satan's counterpart. What is the real issue about Tammuz? 
Tammuz is just another title for guess who? Anti, uh, not the Antichrist, well, Antichrist spirit. It's Nimrod. It's another title for Nimrod. Remember, this is a twisted relationship. Mom and son are having sexual relations. Pretty sick. Yes, they had a baby together. That's just it's messed up. So this is how Babylon celebrates Tammuz's birthday. Again, this is going to sound familiar. Tammuz's birthday is on December 25th. Hmm. Tammuz's birthday, December 25th, right? And this is what they do. They burn what's called a Yule log. This thing right here. They burn a Yule log. And then the next day, there's a beautiful decorated evergreen tree declaring new life. Sound familiar? Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> Christmas is the deal. Now, now, I won't. This is why I'm saying use wisdom. Because I'm not advocating for like, oh my gosh, are you saying we should never have a Christmas tree and give gifts? And that's not what I'm saying. But you need to know the origin of it. The origin of it comes from Tammuz's birthday, December 25th, because Jesus was not born on December 25th. If you read the Gospel of Luke, all the clues are in there when he's born. And that's why these are why the names are so important. So when you're reading Chronicles and all those, you're like, why are these names? And I can't pronounce them. And why? This is why. Because it tells us that Zechariah is of a certain line that at a certain time of the year has to go into the temple to do incense for the prayers of the people. What happens to Zechariah when he goes in there? He meets who? Gabriel. Gabriel, who tells him he'll be having a son who goes, how could this be? I'm old. And he goes, here's a sign. You won't be able to talk to your son's born. Then you can start a countdown. And then what happens is Zachariah's wife, Elizabeth, is six months pregnant. Who comes to visit? Mary. Who is pregnant with who? Jesus. Jesus. And you get a countdown from there and you find out Jesus is actually born on Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles in October, right around October 8th. Fulfilling prophecy. Fulfilling prophecy because it's the first and second coming celebration. What happened is the Romans took it when all of a sudden it's like, we're a Christian nation and we're going to do that. Okay, we're going to take all these teachings and we're going to take all that Babylonian. We're going to take all the Druid stuff. And we're all going to mix it. December 25th. That's Jesus' birthday. It's actually whose birthday? Tammuz. Who was actually Tammuz? Nimrod. Nimrod. For all you who I felt that I've crushed your Christmas dreams... Sorry. Sorry, grandkids. No Christmas for you this year. No. Again, I have seen the extreme of this. I have seen where, where churches have a Christmas tree and there's people who are like, we can't go to this church anymore. They have a Christmas tree. Why do they have the Christmas tree? Do they even know what this is about? Now, I would be more concerned if you showed up to your church and the pastor's like, we decorated this beautiful Christmas tree up front. Now, today as we sing, come in your glory, Lord, we're going to bow to it. Then I would say bounce out. You have a problem. <laughs> All right. Use wisdom in the whole thing. Because the actual celebration in December that is in the Jewish calendar is Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights, which is in John chapter 10, which Jesus actually celebrated when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He pointed to the giant menorah, All right, saying it's him. The menorah reflects, which is this, reflects Jesus. When he says, I am in you and you and me and the vines who are in me, we are one. He's the center. We're all connected in. Here's another thing. So now we're talking about the birthday, the Yule log, the evergreen tree. But here's where it goes a little further. So then they have another celebration that's in the spring where they do this. Oh. And they color eggs. Okay. Eggs being the symbol of life. It's to celebrate Ishtar. And that's where we get the bunny. And no, he will not kill you, nor does he guard a cave. For all you who know what that is. All right. Now, Ishtar is where we actually get the term Easter. That's why it's Resurrection Sunday, not Easter Sunday. Because when it's Easter Sunday, you're saying it's Ishtar Sunday. You're giving knowledge to the Queen of Heaven, who is actually Semiramis, who is the mother of Nimrod. <laughs> it's a Babylonian practice. And you know what? I know people who would try to counter these arguments left and right. What I found is when I talk to them, what they really want to say in between the lines is, but I love chocolate bunnies. 
<laughs> if you like chocolate bunnies, eat a chocolate bunny. Go get a Snickers. You want it yourself? Do you have a Snickers? All right, you're hungry. All right. So anyway. It's a commercial. Exactly. <laughs> that would be a great commercial, by the way. So anyway, again, if I have destroyed your Easter celebration, hey, yes, sir. And so we know for a fact that the Hebrews, like their time schedule, their calendar, and all that, that's still in line with when it was. Originally. Yes, absolutely. That's why it's so important to know that the AM calendar, the Anomundi calendar, because that one lines up very well. According to the Anomundi calendar, we're in the year 5780. So this celebration of Tammuz. Tammuz, again, is Nimrod. And they also say that Nimrod reincarnated at the Tower of Babel, which is not true. He did not reincarnate because the Bible says appoint a man to die once and then the judgment. Okay? So he did not reincarnate. So, but this is where this origin comes from, right here. Tammuz has ties to the ancient mystery cults as he is portrayed as the offspring of an angel. That would make him a what? The Nephilim. A Nephilim. All right. So, this brings up the question, was Nimrod a Nephilim? Because the other story under Babylon is his father was from heaven and his mother was from earth. But then he actually has sexual encounter with his mother. It's a twisted, twisted system, isn't it? You'll never look at Genesis 10 ever again the same. Tammuz is mentioned in the book of Jasher. Again, this is a historical Hebrew book that is mentioned in Joshua. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because Tammuz is Satan's counterfeit. And Nimrod is the foreshadow of the Antichrist. He is the foreshadow of the Antichrist. The first mention of the Antichrist is Genesis 3. The Antichrist is mentioned 33 times in the Old Testament and 13 times in the New. And there are multiple foreshadows through time of the Antichrist. John tells us, 1 John, that the Antichrist spirit is at work in the world and it will get stronger and stronger till the big bad boy Antichrist shows up. But he cannot show up, the men of perdition, until we're taken. So all the plans right now going forward and computer chips and inject chips and all that stuff cannot push forward until we're gone. That's what it says over and over in scripture. You got to know it, settle it in your heart, or you're going to be troubled over and over when you see things. See, the thing is that tribulation brings perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope and hope in Christ doesn't fail. Jesus said we will go through tribulation, not the tribulation. All right. And so the thing I'm getting at with this is there's constant foreshadows. Nimrod was one. Antioch of Epiphanes was another. Hitler was another. Mussolini was another. But the Antichrist spirit is at work in the world today, and you need to recognize what it's doing. What you need to do is keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And when you see all the garbage happening and all the crazy false stuff, you have peace and rest and you don't lose it. Let me give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. And again, this may sound controversial to you. This may be offensive to you. Check this out for a minute. So we are told right now, because of everything, we are to social distance and do all this stuff. And if you go out and about, you have to get your temperature taken, right? There are pictures out there of people getting their temperature taken at their forehead with a radar gun. And people are getting used to this. Radar gun to the head, radar gun to the head. What did the Bible say? That the mark of the beast would be where? Or the right hand. But if I got you conditioned to constantly have something put to your head to check you, by the time it's time to check what the mark is, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, we remember this. We had to do this with COVID. Now, let me put it to you another way. And again, I may hit some nerves with this, but I got to say it. Okay. And I say this with wisdom. Now, I want to point this out very carefully and say this with love. As Americans, do we have the right to protest? Absolutely. It's our First Amendment right. We can do that. Do we have the right to say we don't like something? Absolutely. It's our constitutional rights. Okay. It's our constitutional rights to say, I don't agree with the government. I don't like what the government's doing. I don't agree with this politician or that politician. So guess what we have? We have this amazing thing called the legal system. Where we can vote and we can vote them out of office if we don't like it. Now, the hope is it works. Okay. So here's what I want to get at. And this is what I, I want to point out. 
Do you guys remember the picture that came out with all the Democrats kneeling and they had the African garb and there were people from Africa going, what are you doing wearing that? They're kneeling. And then everybody kneeled. I get the purpose because the cop was kneeling on him. So we're kneeling too for the same amount of time to say, hey, look, it was injustice. I'm tracking with that. I get that. Here's what I'm getting at. What I did observe of some of the protests was this. There wasn't a, hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we're going to do. Due to the protests, we want to have some reverence for Reverend George Floyd. So because George Floyd was unjustly what happened, we're going to take a moment to kneel in silence. Now, if you can't kneel, that's okay. We understand because maybe you have a medical condition. But please stand for a moment of silence. What I observed that didn't happen it was you must kneel. You must kneel. And what I observed, they wanted the police to kneel. They wanted the 82nd Airborne in Minnesota to kneel. They wanted people to kneel. And then the other thing I noticed that was happening, there were a lot of signs where they were holding saying, say his name, say his name, say his name. I get that. Okay, I get that. Like you're very upset about what happened. And I understand it because it was wrong. Here's what I'm getting at. And this is what I want you to understand. So I was praying about it. And the Lord really spoke to me in these last three weeks because I'm going to tell you, man, when I saw some of the stuff like the burning and destroying and the destruction of Minnesota and the destruction of La Mesa and it bothered me. It really bothered me because it wasn't people anymore going, we don't like this injustice. It became destruction and lawlessness. What did Jesus say? Lawlessness will abound. That's Matthew 24. Lawlessness will abound. But here's the thing. I've been praying and praying. And the Lord also puts this verse in my mind. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And I went, oh, wait a minute. Everyone in the streets is kneeling and they're saying, say his name, say his name, say his name. And they're chanting something else. And Jesus goes, and I hear him go, it's blasphemy. They're blaspheming because they're mocking. Now, let me put it one more step further for you to understand this. They're ripping down all these statues. When you rip down statues, let me tell you something. You end up rewriting history. I don't care how wicked the past is. You have to remember, I'm a Jew. Six million of us were killed by Nazis. I remember because I was taught to remember. And me and my wife, we taught our kids to remember. And if you remove the concentration camps as disgusting as they were, guess what will happen? It will be forgotten. It will happen again. So you're tearing down all these statues. You're going to rewrite history. So how far back do you want to go? Wipe out Jesus and say he was never crucified? That he was never in the history books? Oh, here's one further for you. Just food for thought. And again, if you're offended, come talk to me afterwards. So you're tearing down all these statues, but it's open real estate for a whole new statue. Guess which one? It's the image of the beast. Listen to me. Use wisdom in this. Use wisdom because lawlessness is abounding faster and faster and faster. And I want to point this out. The answer is Jesus Christ. You want peace? It's Jesus Christ. You want true global peace? It's Jesus Christ. You want true justice? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus died for the entire world to set us free. He loves us. He gave his life for us. If you were the only one here, he would die for you to set you free because he loves you. He knew you in the womb. He formed you. He loves you deeply. And the only thing you can do is preach Jesus. I like what Raul Reese said. It made sense to me when he said this. You want to talk politics in church? Leave the pulpit. Go be a politician. If you're going to be a pastor, preach Jesus in the midst of the lawlessness. And preach the truth, what Jesus is in the midst of the lawlessness. And that's what I want to encourage you guys to do because that's all you can do and pray. See, the thing is what happened is the Lord began to tell me, keep your eyes on me in the midst of the chaos. And guess what happened? All the chaos melted away. It was gone. It was gone. And then the Lord kept reminding me of things. But I'll give you another example. Chronicles. David is being called out to battle and he's waiting and he's like, Lord, Shall we go? And the Lord says, wait for me in the tree line. And I will tell you when to come out. So their whole army's in a tree line. And he hears. <laughs> and it's an angelic army coming in with the Lord in the sky. Above the tree line. Man, I don't know about you. But if I got to go to combat. Which I did. And I hear an angelic army coming out of the sky. How much would that encourage you? 
if you're the enemy and there's an angelic army coming out of the sky, how much would you run away? You know, I see them, but that in the sky, I don't know. I'm out, you know? <laughs> I don't care what kind of weapon you have. And the thing is, is when you study Daniel 9, because this all ties to Nimrod, what happens? Psalms 2 says it. Why do the nations rage? They rage against God. Okay? And then Daniel says they take their weapons and they don't do this to each other anymore. They do this. And they point it to the Lord because they want to fight him with conventional weapons. How crazy. Crazy do you have to be? How delusion have to be that you think you will take the Lord out with an M16? Or a howitzer? Or a high Mars? C4? You can't. One angel wiped out 184,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. It's crazy, huh? Now listen. So what I also want to encourage you in is this. I want you, and this is what I've been doing, I want you to pray. For what you're seeing you see the chaos i want you to pray for those in the chaos because there's this guy i don't know if you heard of him he was doing a lot of chaos and killing a lot of christians in the name of god and then he got knocked off his donkey on the road to damascus and, and then he wrote two-thirds of the new testament he was just doing chaos there could be a paul in the midst of that chaos and i believe that the lord spirit is moving on the people to draw them out to come to them because every generation has this be the light in the darkness, all right? Now, I want to get back into this, how it's connected. So Nimrod foreshadows the Antichrist. And what I'm telling you right now is we're seeing the Antichrist movement and spirit getting stronger and stronger. Satan places his counterfeit in Babylon. And this is why we see Babylon known as the false religious system. Nimrod begins to build and conquer. And in the year 1928 on the AM calendar, the Anumundi calendar, is when he does this. It only takes 271 years because they have longevity of life from the end of the flood for corruption to build an empire. 271 years. So from the time of the flood to the time of the corruption, 271 years. Not too long, right? How long has the U.S. been around for? How old is the Marine Corps? Less than 250. They were founded around the same time. 271 years, corruption kicked in. It was only in the last 60 years that the confusion of languages happened in the year 1988 on the AM calendar. And then Esau, it says in the book of Jasher that Esau, he killed Nimrod with the sword in the year 2123, making Nimrod 215 years old when he died because of the longevity of life. Remember, they had longevity of life. This is how we look at some of the legends we're finding in some of the cultures. And we actually find out it's actually, they're talking about Shem or Ham. Like we talked about last week, the God, the Egyptian God, Amun-Ra and all them, and the one that was actually Ham, the goat head one. Now, I want to point out something else here. So Nimrod, who had a wicked reign his whole life, I want to point out this comes from somewhere. So Ishtar here, according to the religion of the Babylonians, had a husband whose name was Marduk. Marduk, M-A-R-D-U-K. You laugh, but this is Marduk. What does he got? Cherubim. He's a cherubim. Marduk. He's considered the god of Babylon. Marduk means the bull calf. What did Israel worship in the desert after Moses went up on the mountain? Golden calf. The golden calf. So Marduk actually means the bull calf. That's the symbol of Marduk right there is the calf. It gets even better. Marduk had another symbol. It was the symbol of the serpent dragon. Who's the serpent dragon? Lucifer. Satan. Who's actually Marduk? It's Lucifer. It is actually Lucifer. So the god of Babylon is Lucifer, Satan. And when we fast forward to Revelation, it says that the whore of Babylon rides on a beast and all the world drinks of the cup of her fornication. See, it starts in Babylon. It ends in where? Babylon. And no, New York is not Babylon. Nor is D.C., nor is America. Babylon is in the Middle East. The thing that happens is we as Americans, this is what we love to do. We love to go, oh, you mean the United States is the center of biblical world? No. You mean, see, see, Jesus can't come back until the United States collapses because we haven't been persecuted. And, and the Bible says, woe to America. Is that what it says? No. It's all about the Middle East. It's all about Israel, the center. Israel is the apple of God's eye. Here's another thing I want to show you. Marduk, which is Satan. This is the really interesting thing about this. 
The concept of Marduk and the worship of Marduk goes like this. Marduk, the symbol of the serpent dragon, the supreme God over all the earth. That's what they called him. The supreme God over all the earth. Again, who's that? But he had a man that represented him on earth. The Antichrist. Who was that man who represented Marduk? Nimrod. Tammuz. So Nimrod was supposedly the embodiment, offspring of Marduk. It's a foreshadow. And then again, we read scripture. What is Genesis chapter 3 says? I will put enmity between your seed, talking to the serpent, and her seed. He will bruise his heel, and the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. But who is the seed of the serpent? It's the Antichrist. The Antichrist. Marduk was worshipped every new year at the Ishtar gate. This is the Ishtar gate right here. This is another rendition. This is actually in a museum. And if you notice, there's animals on here. And one of them, really close, is the serpent god. And if you look at it, the back claws, like a serpent, and the front, like a lion, which almost sounds like a griffin. griffin. And do you guys remember how we started this study? I know it's been a couple weeks, how California got its name. The land of the caliphate is what it meant. That was based on a pagan queen who fought against Christians. That was from the Middle East. And California means land of the caliphate. I know, I'm just crushing hopes and dreams tonight. So much for California, city of angels. Sound like a recruiter. <laughs> wow. Like a recruiter, he said. Just crushing dreams. Wow. Okay. Here's the thing. So this is the, like we showed you, the Ishtar gate. You guys may not know this, but this is the Ishtar gate. Now, other than Nick, does anybody want to guess where this is? Other than Nick. Anybody know where this is? No, you don't get to look it up, Fernando, on the phone. No cheating. All right. I'll show you another picture of it. So there is Marduk. Hollywood. It's Hollywood. Hollywood actually built the Ishtar Gate. Okay? So why is the Ishtar Gate with the symbol of Marduk and the other symbols of their gods? This is the serpent one. Why is it the big centerpiece in Hollywood? And if you were to see an aerial view, it sits center in Hollywood. Yep. Really? Yes. I'm telling you, there's a lot of things I found, but we'd be here for hours, and some of it was very disturbing. Now, I want to show you some other thing here. Marduk, in Hebrew, has three meanings. In the Hebrew language, Marduk has three meanings. The first one means the wing of rebellion. The wing of rebellion, Marduk in Hebrew, the wing of rebellion. The second meaning in Hebrew is open rebellion. Open rebellion. So the first one, wing of rebellion. Second one, open rebellion. And the third meaning in Hebrew, descended due to rebellion. Descended due to rebellion. Okay, I just told you the meaning of Marduk in Hebrew, the three meanings. And I want to read this to you. Listen very carefully to what it says. This is out of Isaiah 14. Starting verse 12. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Who is that? That's Lucifer. And here, Marduk in Hebrew means open rebellion, wings of rebellion, and rebellion are descended due to rebellion. Marduk is Lucifer. Yep, the five I wills. Nimrod means rebellion. Marduk, rebellion. Nimrod was a mighty hunter. In other words, he rebelled before God and he hunted humans. He hunted humans for sport. He was a foreshadow of the Antichrist. That should bother you just a little bit or a lot. Why? Because if he's a foreshadow of the Antichrist and he's hunting humans, what do you think the Antichrist is going to do? Hunt humans. Guess who he's going to hunt? The saints. The saints. He's going to hunt those who were not taken were left 
that come to know Christ and he's going to hunt the Jews. Zachariah says that the Antichrist will kill two thirds of the Jews. Hitler killed one third. The Antichrist is going to kill two thirds. He's going to double. Oh, he just sounds racist. Okay. Where does that come from? Racist. That sounds racist, he says. Yes. Where does that come from? It comes from uh, Satan. Yes. Racism comes from the evil one. See, little children don't naturally hate. They're taught to hate. Look up uh, the PLO or Hezbollah or them when they're up against the IDF and they want the little kids to hurt the IDF. They don't know what to do. The little kids go up there and high five them and shake their hands and wave flags. And they come back and they have to teach them, throw a rock at them. They have to be taught to hate. Now, sin naturally happens. Like, you don't have to be taught to lie. You will naturally lie as a kid. You will naturally, you caught, you will be like, no, I didn't. Did you eat a cookie? You have like chocolate like this. <laughs> no, man, I didn't eat anything. No, I didn't, I didn't touch no cookie. You didn't touch any cookie. No, what's that on your face? Oh, you know, I fell in some mud. You know. That's from yesterday. Yeah. But to hate, to learn to hate an individual, that's taught. And that concept comes from Satan. What did Jesus say? Jesus says, if you look at your brother with hate in your heart, you have committed murder. So let me swing this back around to a huge question. We have a massive injustice happen. Now I'm very upset and I'm going to go protest. That's my right. I can do that. I'm out there screaming out of hate. Hmm. Now I got a problem. I want to destroy property out of hate. Now I got a problem. What does the word of God say? If I have hate in my heart, I'm actually committing what? Murder. Okay, so this is going to really bug people. If an injustice, let's say, happens to Fernando, and we're angry about it, and out of hate I take vengeance, what do I become? Murder. Even if I don't murder the person in my heart, I be, I'm a murderer. Yeah. yeah, vengeance is the Lord's. Let me tell you something. Flowing into you, it comes out to people that you love them. This is why missionaries can go overseas and have horrendous things happen to them and still love their captors and still preach Jesus to their captors. And then the captors turn around and give their lives to Christ. If you don't believe me, you already met somebody like that. That person came here years ago when you guys were here and his whole family follows Jesus now. But at one point he was held as a prisoner. I'm not going to say his name or where he's at because to protect him. But where he lives is 99% Muslim, and he preaches Jesus to them. That's love. I want you guys to learn to stand firm in the love of Jesus Christ and keep your eyes on him. And if people are being aggressive about what's happening in the world, they're afraid. And, and when they become afraid, guess what's the next thing that comes out? Anger. Anger has to do with fear. Preach Jesus, the love of Christ to them. And if you're sitting there going, I hate this person, you're wrong. You are wrong. You can be like, I don't like what they're doing. I don't like their character. I don't like their conduct. But you have to understand the true enemy is who? Lucifer. Lucifer. It's Satan and his army. And listen, this is where I'm going to end this tonight. We finally got back together a little bit here. But look what happened to the churches. They all got scattered. Can't go to church, can't worship together. But we're watching online. Hey, that's great. There's something missing there because it's so much better being together and letting the Spirit of God move on you. And, in, and then you're on your own. You feel isolated and Satan begins to lie to you and he's united and there's a satanic army united against the church. And I don't mean the buildings. I mean the people. And even people in the church are afraid. Why are you afraid? So this is for the people online. Why are you afraid? You shouldn't be afraid. Have no fear. God will protect you. Now, I'm not saying be unwise. I'm saying use wisdom and don't be afraid. Because I tell you what, man, if I became afraid by the spirit of fear, we wouldn't be here right now. We would still be all like, I don't know, man, maybe we shouldn't open. What if they can't? Oh, oh my gosh. What if they look in and there's no mask on? The Lord's like, open it up. Don't be afraid. He's going to protect you. You know you got angels surrounding you. You know you got angels surrounding your homes. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 
And there's a world that's hungry for the real deal. You just got to preach the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus Christ. That's what it comes down to. Listen, Republicans won't save you. The Democrats won't save you. The Green Party won't save you. Any political party won't save you. No bills, passed policies, all that stuff. Jesus Christ, love pouring into you is the only thing that sets you free from the chaos. Man, I'll tell you what, man, I'm living proof because the Lord crashed in and he just melted it all gone. All gone. And it all went away. I'm not naive, trust me, but man, I got peace. I ain't afraid. I'm not afraid. You know what it is? When you're in Christ, are you afraid to die? No. Someone says to me, I'm not afraid to die, but I hope they don't feed us to the lions. And I said, yeah, I ain't afraid to die either. But you know what I'm a little bit afraid of? That lion, he might chomp a little bit and it's going to hurt. See, we're afraid of the pain that comes with it. Because a bullet through the head is fast. By the time you hear bang, you don't even know what happened. It's, you're with the Lord. You hear boom, and it's like, whoa. And then God's grace comes upon you. And there's horrendous ways that, that people in Christ have died. You know, stoned to death, torn apart, shot with arrows, burned alive, fed to the lions, sawed in half. Isaiah was sawed in half with a wooden saw. Peter was crucified upside down after watching his wife be crucified. Picture that. You are a man of God serving the Lord. Your wife is being crucified in, fr in front of you. And the crazy thing is, is when they have the historical counts of what the Roman soldiers saw, Peter's words were, remember the cross, remember Jesus. That's the encouragement he gave his wife. And then when they go to crucify him, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. I mean, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Because no one in their common sense without the Holy Spirit would be like, absolutely, nail me to that thing. I'm all for it. That's what I'm telling you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And use wisdom because Nimrod is just a foreshadow of what we're seeing today. What we're seeing today is the Antichrist spirit moving in power again. And you know what the beautiful thing is, ladies and gentlemen? They can come up with chips. They can come up with injections. They can come up with everything. And it can't come into play until the king of kings says, bring my people home. Then it will come in. But until then, do not fear. Have no fear. Amen? Amen? Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you. Uh, wow, thank you for this message. It did not go like I thought. Um, Holy Spirit, thank you for speaking. And I just pray for encouragement for everyone as they go home not to be afraid. For those online, uh, just to be encouraged. Um, there's chaos happening everywhere, lawlessness abounding. But Lord Jesus, you're coming home. You're coming to get us and take us home soon. The promise you've given us in the word, Lord, is that you would take us. It's over in scripture, over and over from the beginning to the end. So, Lord, we just pray right now. You encourage as we, we go home, encourage us. Keep us strong in your word. Keep us always focused on you, Lord. And those who have felt like. They are hurting, that, that their fear has kicked in. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I, I want those people to know that the fear that's come over them, it's a spirit. It's a spirit of fear. This is what the scripture says, it's a spirit of fear. And the chaos and confusion it says, Lucifer, Satan is the author of confusion. And when he speaks his native tongue, he speaks lies. But Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. So Lord, we pray right now. We rebuke that spirit of fear in this place. We rebuke that spirit of fear over the people. And Lord, we pray that you would begin to just radically move your spirit and draw in the last of the Gentiles, Lord, because the count is getting smaller and smaller. May we ever be sharing the gospel because it may be the last Gentile to come in. So Lord, we love you. We bless you. And we wait for your return. We pray you come quickly to get us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this place, and thank you for being faithful to a tiny, tiny place in this town. Keep your angels around us and protect us. 